critical breakthrough was the idea at some point that mTOR must work by being bound to other proteins. Now, again, this seems like obvious, right? Like everyone talks about the TOR complex, but, but at the time it wasn't. And the reason was that, of course, we and others had looked. We'd said, okay, isolate mTOR, does it have friends? And the answer was no, it has no friends. Explain yes. how this molecule, mTOR, which sits at the epicenter of our existence as living entities on this planet, how does it do its job? One thing to, for the listeners to understand is that rapamycin is, is quite unique and in another aspect that we haven't talked about, but also was very exciting at the time, right? Rapamycin, unlike most drugs, right? Most drugs go and find their protein target and do something, usually inhibit that target. Rapamycin gets in the cell, binds to a little protein, FKBP. What it does to FKBP, frankly, doesn't seem to matter at all, but instead hijacks that protein and now takes it and makes it bind to mTOR. It basically uses it as this thing that it draws next to mTOR and that moving of FKBP to mTOR is actually critical for how rapamycin acts. And, and as, as people like Stuart Schreiber have pioneered, it's, it's really a molecular glue that connects mTOR and FKBP and that interaction is absolutely critical. Um, so how does... Uh, uh, mTOR work. So, you know, when, when we first and others found mTOR, it was this big protein. Uh, it looked like a kinase. That is, it's a protein that puts phosphates onto other proteins. Uh, but yet, what it did, what its targets were, were completely unclear. And I think as we were talking in the pre-session, Matt pointed out, it's incredibly complicated. It, it probably acts on hundreds of other proteins. Now, in general, what are those other proteins? They're either proteins that make the cell build things, this anabolism side, or break it down. And, and on the breaking down side, as you and I, Peter, have discussed, I'm sure Matt agrees, it's aut autophagy, right? The, the self-eating and destruction of parts of the cell, sometimes aged parts of the cell, sometimes parts that are damaged for other reasons. That seems to be absolutely critical on the, on the catabolic uh, side. And, you know, for a long time, we had mTOR. We couldn't really get it to phosphorylate anything in a test tube. It just didn't work. It seemed like a terrible kinase. That is, its enzymatic activity was so puny. We even thought maybe it's not really a kinase. It really was like a, a moribund <laughs> protein. And, and the critical breakthrough was the idea at some point that mTOR must work by being bound to other proteins. Now, again, this seems like obvious, right? Like everyone talks about the TOR complex, but, but at the time it wasn't. And the reason was that, of course, we and others had looked. We'd said, okay, isolate mTOR. Does it have friends? And the answer was no, it has no friends. But what we came to realize, and this goes back to sort of serendipity, it turns out the detergents, right? So when, when you have a mammalian cell, it's surrounded by a lipid, sort of a fatty membrane. You have to break that to do biochemistry, it turns out the detergent we were using, which was the most commonly used detergent to break cells, for simply bad luck reasons, broke apart the mTOR complexes. You could never predict this. And why it does it? We don't know. And when we moved to other detergents, used things to stabilize it, we then found these TOR complexes, right? And, and the first breakthrough for us was the discovery of a protein that, that got this name Raptor, um, which uh, at the time people didn't like this name, but now is, is a well-studied protein. And as Matt alluded, there's actually genetics on Raptor that connect it to, to lifespan and the aging process. And so that defined what we now call TORC1 or mTORC1. Another protein that we named Richter defines what we call mTORC2. I'm sure we'll talk about uh, mTORC2 at the time. And so we started building out that complex. And now when you had that thing in a test tube, it did stuff. Like it could show serious activity that you could measure. It could do serious phosphorylation. The known substrates like S6 kinase that before we couldn't phosphorylate S6 kinase to save our life inside a test tube. Now all of a sudden you really could. So it really opened up the door. And then that connected mTORC1 to all the other things that in, in sort of a biological lingo we call upstream, right? All the proteins that communicate to mTOR, bring signals to it, are upstream of it. The things mTOR acts on are downstream of it. And we've actually done very little downstream, I would say. We really focused on the upstream. I would say the next big conceptual breakthrough for us came when we looked inside of cells and saw that mTOR was in a particular place. And this is a an organelle called the lysosome. Uh, 
Um, the, the lysosome is sort of the recycling center. This is where a cell takes things and breaks them down and releases nutrients. And so it turned out that mTOR lived at this very interesting interface where the cell produces its own nutrients by breaking down things and also where the nutrients are coming in from the outside. So at, at that, uh, that intersection. And then we went on then to find lots of the pieces that allow that nutrient sensing. Approximately how many mTOR complexes exist in a typical cell? And let's talk about maybe what the typical cells are. What's the distribution of mTOR concentration across different cells in the body? Things, things like that. In terms of numbers, we're, we're talking certainly thousands of, of complexes in existence. So it's, not, it's not an amazingly rare protein, right? It's not incredibly abundant at all, you know, it's probably in the hundred to a thousand fold less than some of the most abundant proteins in the cell. Um, but not, the proteins are much, much less abundant than that. Um, and it's distributed actually quite evenly between mTORC1 and 2, at least in the cells that, that we have looked uh, in, uh, in, in culture. When you look across tissues in, in a mouse or a rat, it's actually pretty even across tissues as, as, as well. And so to some extent that puts it in the, what sometimes pejoratively is called a housekeeping protein, <laughs> right? Um, now those how, turn how to be some of the most important. How right? <laughs> exactly, some of the most important <laughs> proteins in the cell. So what, what we have found now, and I think others would agree, is that regulation of mTOR levels itself is, is, doesn't happen that much. It does, but it's not the critical regulatory input. It's all the upstream stuff and the regulation of that that really is where the pathway gets fine-tuned in different cells to different inputs. And where I think we, we have to start thinking about also for new modalities to, uh, to target mTOR. Um, so we'll, you know, we'll we park this now. idea of tissue specificity down the line, but if I'm hearing you correctly, even though I don't know that people have sampled the CNS of humans, based on what we know from mice and rodents of you know rats and things like that, we have reason to believe that you would have comparable mTOR concentrations within CNS tissue, peripheral tissue, probably everything, I'm guessing virtually everything except a red blood cell or maybe even a red blood cell. Do we know if it's in the RBC as well? There actually is some in RBC, which has been very confounding to us because RBCs don't have things like lysosomes. Yeah, in there's them. so much it, that there's they're even missing. Some, there's even some in platelets. Um, or mitochondria. I, I've actually always wanted to go and look in RBCs for this, uh, for this reason. As far as we can tell, every cell has some mTOR and mTORC1 mm. in it. And I would argue, and, and I'm not sure if I'm 100% correct in this, I would argue that in almost every cell, mTORC1 is a very critical protein for the health of that cell, right? Yeah. And, and Matt alluded to a study, I guess, where some where people have used now catalytic inhibitors, right? And, and we need to distinguish that what rapamycin does, people call it an allosteric inhibitor. It binds to mTOR, but it doesn't bind in the heart of mTOR, right? If the heart is where it does its phosphorylation reaction, that's sort of like the central node of it. It doesn't bind there, it actually binds close, and what it does, it prevents certain substrates from getting to that kinase domain. It kind of sterically blocks them from getting there. Uh, so, so it doesn't fully inhibit all the activities of even mTORC1. So let's give people an analogy, David. So for example, in this case, if the amino acid is like a baseball that's supposed to bind right inside the glove, rapamycin by blocking that doesn't sit itself right in the heart of the glove. It maybe binds outside the glove and closes the glove. It shapes, it changes the shape of the glove so that the intended target doesn't. Is that a good analogy? It is. Now, now the thing that binds in the glove here is ATP, which is the phosphate donor, and then the substrate, let's say, Got S6 it. kinase. But you're, you're exactly right, right? Those things are, ATP can get in there no problem. It's small. It can easily get there. But what happens is basically, it's almost like the entrance to a cave, and now you've put a boulder in the entrance of that cave, but you haven't fully blocked mm -hmm. that entrance. So simplistically speaking, some small things get in there, some smaller substrates can get in there, but some bigger ones can't. And there's also, of course, like as you alluded to, shape changes and stuff. But the simplest way to think about it, it's a steric block of same, some things, but not others. Perhaps also worth just re-mentioning that this is the mTORC1 cave, right? Exactly. Which is again different from the other classes of inhibitors which are going to affect mTOR in both mTOR complex 1 and mTOR complex 2. Exactly. And, and, and Matt, you said that there's been a study now on lifespan or, 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 or at least aging 
writ large with catalytic inhibitors. This is actually something I've always wanted to do because they're extraordinarily toxic molecules when dosed at higher levels. So I'll be curious. To, I, I've not seen this. Uh, but you're right. The catalytic inhibitors basically annihilate the activity of mTORC1 and mTORC2 if used at the right dose. Rapamycin partially inhibits mTORC1 and over time can also partially inhibit mTORC2. So they're very dramatically different how they act.